All right, we're starting our webinar program. We're gonna give it another minute as everybody settles into their Zoom program and then we'll get started. All right, I would like to welcome you all to the Palmer Museum of Arts program, Yukioi Images of the Floating World, Japanese Woodblock Prints from the Permanent Collection. My name is Caroline Koch. I'm a master's student in art history and a graduate assistant at the Palmer. I'm so glad to be here to host this webinar featuring our museum senior curator, Patrick McGrady, who will be speaking about the special exhibition of Yukioi prints on display at the museum now through December 5th. This program is being recorded and the video will be posted on the museum's YouTube channel within the next week. During the talk, we invite you to put your questions into the Q&A feature and you will find this on the Zoom menu. We will have time at the end of the talk to answer questions. And now I'll turn the program over to Dr. McGrady. Well, thank you, Caroline, for that marvelous introduction. Uh, I thought um, we just might start this talk uh, with title, which has a bit of redundancy built into it, which is to say, we state the title twice uh, in the few words that, that, that make, make, that shape this title. But uh, ukiyo-e actually means floating world pictures. So it's, it's, it's the same thing said, said twice. Uh, but re that really doesn't help us a lot for those of you who don't know a lot about Japanese woodblock prints and their place in, in ukiyo-e. Uh, you still have to ask yourself, what exactly are images of the floating world? And the answer to that has a lot to do with this guy. Yazu Tokugawa, Tokugawa, I'm sorry, who was the first shogun of the Tokugawa shogunate. And to explain Yazu's significance, uh, we need to dwell a bit on Japanese history. So I, 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 I trust you'll, you'll stay with me uh, with this image on the, the screen for just a few minutes. Now, by the sixth century of the, the current era, much of Japan had been unified under a single emperor to protect from invasion of barbarians, and that's what they called them from the north, and also to settle warring disputes between various clans within Japan, the emperor would appoint from time to time a shogun or a general to help keep the peace and of course to oversee Japan's military defenses. Now, at first, the, the shogun, of course, answered to the emperor, but after the 12th century, the shogun had gained significant power to become the de facto head of the country, and the emperor really was, re was, was relegated to a more ceremonial uh, position. Uh, the, the shogun, uh, the, the, the shogunate, which uh, describes the shogun's position, uh, was a hereditary position, which is to say that even though technically the shogun was appointed by the emperor, uh, at this point, um, the, because the emperor's role was ceremonious, uh, they could essentially appoint whoever they wanted, the, 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 the shogun. And the shogun then would often pass the shogunate down through his own family. So a clan or family, extended family, could hold the shogunate uh, for centuries, the Tokugawa clan, uh, represented by Yazo here, uh, ruled Japan from 1603 to 1867, so more than 250 years. And it's worth noting, because we'll be talking about this period a lot, the Tokugawa shogunate was the last shogunate in uh, Japanese history. Now, Yezu, 
uh, came to power in 1603 after a long period of constant civil war in Japan. And in doing so, he managed to uh, calm all the various uh, uh, other clans uh, and other lords are called daimyos. Or, uh, they are uh, local rulers of certain sections of Japan. There are often between 200 to 300 daimyos in Japan at any given time. Uh, and in doing so, he established uh, really 250 years of peace and prosperity. We're talking about political, social, and economic stability that Japan had, had never seen. But there was a cost to all of this. And part of that cost was that Japan became increasingly isolationist. By 1639, foreigners, and we're talking about mostly the Dutch, the Portuguese, the Spanish, and the Chinese, they were all essentially kicked out of, uh, out of Japan. Trade with any other country was strictly controlled, and only the Dutch and the Chinese would have access to direct trade uh, with Japan, and then only through the port of Nagasaki. As a matter of fact, they were only allowed to visit an artificial island in Nagasaki Bay, which was called Dejima. Uh, so Japan wanted to distance itself from all other cultures and all other political and economic uh, contact uh, throughout the world. Most significantly, the Japanese themselves were forbidden to travel outside of the country. Now, this period of peace was called the Pax Takagua, as a matter of fact. Uh, this period resulted in a thriving middle class, which was both educated and sophisticated. In their leisure time, uh, they would focus on local amusements. They visited the theater. They certainly visited brothels. They read a lot. They were deeply steeped in Japanese and Chinese literature. They adapted to current fashions and attitudes. They celebrated the world of contemporary pleasure. This was called ukiyo, or the floating world, uh, describing a condition as if one were drifting through life in a manner of a leaf floating downstream, taking in the pleasures of life as they became available. Artists of the period celebrated this lifestyle by depicting what was consumed, and their work came to be known as ukiyo-e, again, images of the floating world. Now, this growing middle class created an increase in demand for an awful lot of stuff. And one of these was printed texts. Often they were profusely illustrated and this provided that groundswell for the development of the prints that we're going to be looking at today. This is uh, an artist named Mishikawa Moronubu, and it's a page from a book called Pleasures with the Beautiful Women of Japan. Uh, it was published about 1672. And the image that you have here in front of you is a court lady presenting a gift to a high ranking nobleman. Amora Noble was one of the earliest ukiyo-e masters, and he was the first actually to sign his name to, to his works of art. The title of this book, Pleasures with the Beautiful Women of Japan, is really very key to the ukiyo-e aesthetic. This two-page spread that you have here is one of the milder illustrations in, in, in the book. It's full of erotic images called makuri-e, or pillow pictures. Uh, sex, whether implied or implicitly depicted, was central to ukiyo-e from the start, which is why images of beautiful women, or bijin-ga, uh, is one of the major themes of ukiyo-e. On the right is uh, a print by Okomuro Masanobu, uh, courtesan with a client outside of the Miuraya uh, from the series Courtesans of the Yoshiwara. It's a 12 print series uh, depicting the various courtesans that were well known in the y Yashiwara. The Yashiwara uh, was a major brothel uh, in, in uh, I'm sorry, the, the Yashiwara was, was the, the, essentially the red light district uh, in, in Edo, the pleasure district. Uh, prostitution was highly regulated uh, under the Tokugawa shogunate and rendered legal only in designated areas. And the Yashiwara was one of these designated areas. And the Miuraya was a major brothel within the Yashiwara. And so these courtesans were actually, became, they became very well known, not, not, not necessarily celebrated as actors were, as we'll talk about in a moment, but they were depicted by artists on a regular basis. Now, before we leave these two images, I want to note the coloring on both. Uh, both of them are colored by hand. 
And on the left, uh, even though it looks black and white, if you look at the, the, the uh, court lady presenting the gift, her sleeves have a brownish kind of color on it. So someone has begun to hand color uh, this print as well. Now, all Woodbach prints uh, were black and white with hand coloring until the mid 18th century. And it was only then that we got into a situation of coloring them in another way. Uh, this is an image also in the exhibition by Suzuki Haranobu. Uh, Sima Guang rescues his playmates from a water jar. It's around 1767, 1768. Haranobu, the artist who created this image, was one of the earliest practitioners of Nishikie, or they were called brocade prints, prints colored by separately carved blocks. Now, when you think about this, uh, keep in mind the production and the, the need to produce, mass produce these things as the, the, the market increased for these images and it really swelled in the 18th century. Uh, coloring by hand is, can be a very slow process. In this instance, uh, Masanobu would actually present the design. The design would be carved in a key block, a single block of wood uh, printed in black. And then the publisher would have a series of a uh, uh, specialist that would color the prints by hand, very time consuming. Uh, in the 1760s, another approach to making woodblock prints was perfected, not by Haranubu. You will read that Haranubu invented this process. He didn't, a printer did uh, around, almost around 1765. Uh, he invented a process by which the color could be applied by separately carved blocks. So in order to produce this image here on the left, uh, I would imagine in addition to the black and white block, which we call the key block, um, there would be additional five or six other blocks to carry the color. And then they would all be carefully matched and printed, uh, registered when in the printing process and printed by specialists who could handle both the process and the combination of colors. Uh, that radically improved the ability for publishers to produce vast amounts of these, these, these images and when we get to the 19th century, we have instances where we know that like Hiroshida's print blocks, some of them were printed 10,000 times carrying that much image. And we'll see one that shows that it was printed that often. Now, just before we lose, lose this, this, this image, Sima Guang was a well-known 17th century Chinese scholar. He was also a statesman. And this is probably an invented story regarding his childhood when uh, supposedly a playmate fell into a large jar of water. His other friends were couldn't figure out how to save him because the jar was taller than them. And of course, uh, Guang, uh, uh, demonstrating his, his well-known reputation as a clear thinker, is, uh, even as a child uh, depicted here, uh, just picked up a rock and smashed the jar. So the water fell, flowed, flowed out and so did his, did his friend who um, uh, uh, had dropped himself into. The, the jar. Now, also before we leave, leave these two images, I thought I'd spend just a few seconds discussing on how ukiyo-e prints were made. Um, it was a collaborative process. Traditionally, we give these prints over to the artist who designed the image, but the artists throughout the ukiyo -e period, they did not print these images. The artist was responsible, often uh, uh, engaged by a publisher to create a, the design or a series of designs for for, for, the, for the process. Um, and after he produced, the artist produced those designs and handed them over to the publisher, the artist was well out of the picture, usually, but not always. The publisher then took the artist's designs, uh, the, the, literally drawings in ink on, on very fine paper uh, to wood carvers, professional wood carvers, who would then paste the, 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 the drawing on the block of wood and then carve around that design. So the drawing was destroyed in the process. After the blocks were, 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 were carved, the publisher would, would then take to the, the blocks to uh, uh, master printers who then knew how to handle the necessary inks uh, in order to produce the desired colored image. So a collaborative process, we often now are able to identify uh, not only the artist, uh, but the publisher, the printer and sometimes, or, or the, the, and sometimes even the carver. So we, whenever we can, and you'll see, though not here, uh, because there's just too much information for, for the slides, but when you visit the exhibition, in those instances that we know those individuals, we put them on the label as well. Now, back to Bijinga. 
Um, there are, there are uh, here are, are, are two very typical uh, images of the genre, beautiful women. Uh, Isoda Koryusai uh, is the, the, the courtesan, her name is Mitsuayo, Mitsuaya, I'm sorry, of the Diakokuya and with her attendants. And it's from a series titled New Designs for Young Leaves, it printed, uh, published about 1778, 1779. Now, the Daikokuya was another brothel in the Yoshiwara, uh, again, that pleasure district of, of Edo. Uh, the image depicts uh, the courtesan with two younger attendants who are essentially apprentices. These are the, quote, young leaves of the series title. Uh, they are learning how to become courtesans. And it's important that you remember, you keep in mind that, that in most instances, these, these girls, when they entered the profession, did not do so voluntarily they were more than likely sold into the business by their parents. They were essentially indentured uh, in order to, uh, uh, the, the, their parents were paid. And so these folks, these, these kids had to work off their indenture uh, through prostitution. Uh, and it was virtually impossible because of the vast amount of expenses to train the courtesans in their, their various uh, uh, duties. Uh, it was impossible for them to purchase their way out of the arrangement and release only came uh, with an age in which they were no longer uh, of value to the owner of the brothel. On the right-hand side, you have a very different situation uh, by Kitagawa of uh, Utamaro. It's a parody uh, from the Chushungura. It's act two of the Chushungura. It's from a series, Famous Beautiful Women in a Parody of the Chushungura from the later years of the 18th century. Uh, Utamaro the, was one of the great depictors of beautiful women, again, Beijing Ga. Uh, here, the, the two women that are represented are probably waitresses in a tea house in the Yoshiwara. Uh, so providing a very different service than the courtesans would provide. Uh, and emphatically, they, they were not courtesans. That is to say, that wasn't their job. And technically they were forbidden the practice of, of prostitution. Uh, but we all know that on the side, it's always possible that they did but they were not supposed to. Now the Chushungura, an ancient story really, uh, that, that uh, was originally written for the Kabuki theater, it's the story of the 47 Ronin. A Ronin is a samurai, a, a warrior attached to a daimyo, uh, whose master a daimyo has either died or been killed. In this instance, the daimyo uh, is Lord Anya. Uh, he was tricked by an evil Moro now into unsheathing his sword in, in, the, in a shogun's castle. And in doing so, that act uh, was, it was forbidden. And so it forced him to commit suicide. Anya's samurai, now Ronin, uh, the, uh, seek revenge throughout the rest of the story. In act two of the Chushungura, one of the samurai, he's, he's, he's named, but I've actually forgotten his name, uh, slashes a pine tree in half with his sword as an indication of what he thinks more now, of how he thinks more now should be confronted. Of course, that's what's being parodied in Utumar by Utumaro's waitresses. Uh, the figure on the left uh, gestures with a very tiny uh, pair of scissors. Snip, snip, she goes, as though to suggest, this is the way I take care of him. And of course, I'll leave you to your imagination to uh, wonder uh, just exactly what she meant by that gesture. Another image uh, by, by Utumaro here on the left, uh, Caria blossoms from the series Flowers of Edo, Young Female Chanters uh, from the very early years of the 19th century. Now, this woman uh, is ostensibly performing on a samisan, you know, an early form of a guitar uh, in Japan, uh, which probably identifies her as a geisha. Again, at the time, specifically not a courtesan, uh, but she was trained instead as an entertainer or performer. Um, geisha, the proper, the closest um, interpretation. Uh, or translation in English is, is, is an artist. It literally means art doer or art maker. And so uh, it, there were many beautiful women uh, that were depicted by, by uh, uh, Japanese artists in Ukiyo-e, uh, some of them courtesans, some of them waitresses, others were poets, uh, others, so others were entertainers. Now note that with these last three prints, uh, the inventive context for the beautiful women uh, uh, really uh, extends all over the place. They matched beautiful women with uh, stories like the Kushingura. 
Uh, they matched them with a series of flowers found near Tokyo. Artists were always exploring ways to present uh, their subjects. And I, and I think we have one more. Yes, this is uh, Ikeda Aizen. Uh, and he's uh, depicting uh, a beautiful woman in the snow with an umbrella. It's actually, and we've only recently discovered this, it's at the left panel from a triptych, which is to say a three sheet uh, presentation uh, uh, titled Fashionable Figures at Dawn on a Snowy Day. It's from the 1830s and that triptych, they were all triptychs, is from a series of triptychs uh, uh, titled The Four Seasons. So I might, I've never seen this series, but I imagine it would be uh, three prints representing each season of, of the year. What's interesting about this image is its coloration. It's predominantly blue. Uh, and that has a lot to do with a synthetic pigment called Prussian blue that only recently had entered Japan through Nagasaki. Now, Prussian blue was invented in the early 18th century in Berlin. It's a brilliant color, synthetic color, uh, actually discovered by accident by, by the chemist who discovered it. And it's very stable. Uh, when it was discovered in the early 17th century, Western artists went crazy with it because it, unlike other blues that were created in, in, in Europe at the time, it, it, was, it, it was fast. It wouldn't fade very, very quickly. And so it, it held its brilliance for an awful long time. And when it was introduced in Japan, right around 1830, it, 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 it quickly caught on like crazy, like wildfire, as a matter of fact. Um, because up to this point, blue in Japan uh, was, was made from a plant extract that faded very quickly when, when uh, uh, exposed to light for any length of time uh, and faded to a brown or yellow when, 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 when that exposure took place. And we'll see uh, that, how that happens in just a moment. And so when this Prussian blue started to appear in Japan, um, the artist immediately recognized its, uh, its, its, its quality and a craze developed for predominantly blue colored prints. They were called azurie or blue printed pictures. Uh, it's a craze that, that, that was, was all over the place in Japan for only about five years. And then almost as quickly as it developed, it, it faded away. And after about uh, 1835 or so, you didn't really see a lot of it. Now, another major theme for Ukiyo-e was the depiction of actors. And here are two uh, of the three actor prints in the show. Actors were movie stars of their day. Uh, when artists depicted actors uh, of the theater, uh, they were called Yakusha-e, uh, 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 hugely popular, uh, the actors were, and the prints were as, as well, especially in the later years of, of, of the 18th century, um, the actors' careers were avidly followed and recorded. Um, and often uh, they were identified in the text accompanying the image, but they could also be identified by their mon, M-O-N, or crest, that were worn on their costumes. And, and you can see over there to the left, for example, uh, the, the mon on the lower figure in the right uh, is, is Karaoka. Uh, he, he, we know that that's who he is, but we can also identify him by his gesture. Kataoka built his career on his famous cross-eyed scowl that he used in performances. Um, these, um, again, these, 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 these prints were almost like baseball cards. Uh, people collected them because they knew the actors. And indeed, remember, the, the collectors of these prints, the purchasers, the consumers of these prints, they, they were very highly engaged in the theater. They, they, it was a major form of entertainment and they, they avidly followed the actor's career. And so um, they were widely correct, uh, collected. Um, uh, many of the ukiyo artists knew the actors very well. Uh, Toyo Kuni, for example, here on the left, uh, was, was celebrated. He, this is what made him famous were his actor portraits. Um, he was known to spend hours with actors conversing backstage after and, and before performances. Uh, he was very involved in the theater district throughout his career. Landscapes became po a popular theme in, in, only in the 19th century. Uh, prior to the 19th century, you would see landscapes in Japanese woodblock prints, but mostly as background, either for actors or uh, beautiful women or other genre 
uh, scenes uh, being played out uh, in front of the landscape. But in the 19th century, particularly in the hands of someone like Katsushika Hokusai, um, the, the uh, natural beauty of, of, of Japan began to be celebrated. Um, Hokusai uh, was very key, as a matter of fact, in elevating the depiction of the landscape. And because of his work and other artists like Hiroshiga that we'll talk about in a moment, uh, he was, and those the three other artists were responsible for elevating uh, the depiction of the landscape to a genre that rivaled actors and beautiful women in, 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 in subject matter. His 36 views of Mount Fuji, represented here in the Seven Mile Beach in Sagama, Sagami province, uh, became hugely popular even before he completed the series. He started working it in 1830 and only finished it in, in 1833. Uh, it was so popular that the publisher asked for 10 more designs before Hokusai finished designing the first, 50, uh, first 36. So in fact, there are not 36 views uh, of Mount Fuji in the series, but there are actually 46 in the series. The first 10 that uh, Hok Hiroshiga, uh, I'm sorry, that, that Hokusai uh, uh, produced, uh, all executed in 1830, were actually uh, azurian. Uh, they were blueprinted blue pictures. And as you can see here in the image, um, the uh, blue predominates. And of course, this added to their popularity at the time between 1830 and, 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 and 1835. Interestingly, you know, th this, this is one of those blocks that I was mentioning, and you can tell by the condition, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. This is one of the blocks that was probably, could, could have been printed as much as 10,000 times over many, many years of, of the artist's uh, lifetime. And so um, after this, uh, other printers and would get a hold of the blocks and other publishers would manage the blocks and they would print them with different colors. It was really only in the 1830s that this predominance of blue uh, was, was uh, identified in his series of, of the views of Mount Fuji that were very different in, in the, the, for example, in 1840 when they would have been printed. And so we know that this is actually an early pull from the block, but nonetheless, if you look, for example, along the horizon, uh, a lot of those clouds are no longer printing because the block is worn away. And up at the top, you see not a blue sky where you would normally see blue at the very top, um, but it's turned to a brownish yellow or yellowish brown. That's because the blue that was used there, specifically not the blue in other parts of print, but the blue that was used there was the traditional blue from uh, plant matter. It wasn't a stable blue. And so after a long exposure to light, you know, it's, we're not talking about just a few minutes or even a few hours, but over many, many years, um, it fades to this kind of, well, drab color. Compare this, for example, to another print from the same series in the museum's collection. This is um, um, uh, Mount Fuji, and you can barely see it under the bridge there, but if you look carefully, you can see Mount Fuji um, uh, under Menin Bridge in Fukugawa. Uh, a town which uh, obviously can, you can still see Mount, Mount Fuji uh, from again 1830. This also is uh, Azurie uh, because of the predominance of blue and note uh, up at the, at the very top, that's what the print should look like on the left, but we've lost that blue. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing, it's a good thing. We know that, it's, that, that the one on the left-hand side is a very early, relatively early pull from the, the series, probably around 1830. Uh, but on the other hand, we've lost a lot of the color. So it's a, it's, you, you, you get some things and you lose other things. Now, Mount Fuji, of course, is the theme that connects the images in this series together. Uh, Fuji, of course, a very popular uh, landmark in Japan. It's the tallest mountain in, in the country, an active volcano, although not recently, uh, the last eruptions were in the 18th century. Um, and it's one of the three holy mountains uh, of Japan. And so it's a well-known and, and, and greatly admired image. And so a, a great uh, uh, theme to, to build a series around. And, and Japanese artists are always looking for these themes. Another was the main road between the capital of Japan, Kyoto, and the seat of the shogun's administration, which was Edo, current, current day uh, Tokyo. And that was the Eastern Sea Road. Uh, called the Tokaido. And I'll bring up a map of Japan. Uh, here is a, a 
a contemporary map, uh, probably, I don't know when it was published, but very recently. And if I, yes, here, here if we have Edo out there, Tokyo uh, to the east and to the west is Kyoto. Um, well, some 53, 53 days of travel uh, away from Edo. And so um, the 53 stations of the Tokaido are, are essentially stops along the road, uh, which represents about a day's travel by foot or walking, uh, the horse, horses walking and other people walking uh, from one station to the next. So each one of these stations about a day's uh, journey apart. And, and I should mention that the, the Tokaido uh, or uh, Eastern Sea Road uh, was built by uh, Iyazu uh, Tokugawa in order to connect these two places. Edo was where uh, the Tokugawa shogunate had its administration and Kyoto is the, where the empire, em, emperor lived. That was this te technically the capital uh, of Japan. And so that uh, ability to travel on, on well uh, take roads that were well taken care of was absolutely critical for the growth of Japan during the Tokugawa uh, shogunate. And, and Yazu was, was already working on the road when he became uh, shogun. Um, the travel on the road, of course, it could carry official business. Uh, it was used for the transportation of goods, but also was used for uh, travel for pleasure. Uh, again, the Japanese couldn't travel outside the country. And so they traveled in the country and, and uh, took uh, great care to recognize the beauty of, 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 of their country in, in those travels. And so uh, each one of these stations uh, became very well known for the scenes that are present, are presented of uh, uh, the, the ja Japanese countryside. Uh, each, each station would uh, offer facilities for respite for travelers on the road. Uh, that's where they could find food and shelter uh, for the evening. Now, probably the most famous series of views of the Tokaido uh, was produced by Uzugawa Hiroshida. Uh, here you have um, uh, Fujikawa, which is uh, one of the stops along the road. Um, Hiroshida uh, was rivaled only by Hokusai as, as, a, la uh, as a landscape artist. Uh, in 1832, he actually talked his way um, into a minor administrative position in Edo in order to travel with the official annual procession on the Tokaido to deliver gift horses from the shogun to the emperor. And this was, uh, again, an annual ceremonial uh, uh, procession in which the, the, uh, the, the um, uh, shogun, at the time his name was uh, Yanari Tokugawa, uh, the shogun would pay homage to, to the emperor in, in this manner. Uh, so Hiroshika is traveling with this procession and along the way he makes, makes sketches of each one of the stations that later would be carved into uh, his 53 views or 53 stations of the Tokaido. Again, this is Fujikara, uh, Kawa from uh, it's, it's station number 38 along the way. So it's a little over two thirds of the way uh, from Edo to Kyoto. As the, and you, the imagery here, as you can see, as the procession passes, the commoners there to the left with their, their big round hats, uh, they prostrate themselves um, in, in, in a gesture of honor. Um, the, the horses, each one of them is decorated with, with what's called a gohai. Uh, these are wooden wands that are that, that with, with white zigzagging streamers that are used in Shinto uh, ritual to signify that the objects, in this case, the, the horses that are traveling, signify that those objects have been sanctified. And so that's how we identify those gifts. They are very special gifts. And as they pass by on their way, this is the outskirts of Fuji, Fujikawa. Uh, as they pass by, all other uh, uh, travelers on the road need to prostrate themselves in, in homage. Now, the 53 stations uh, of, of, of Hiroshiga, uh, and indeed there are actually 55 prints because you start at the Niambushi Bashi Bridge in Edo and you end in Kyoto. So there are actually two more that, that stand as, as, as pillars on either side of these 53 stations. Uh, these, th this series uh, really made Hiroshiga's uh, career. Uh, he went on to do as many as another 19 series involving the Tokaido. We're actually not, sh not sure because we're still trying to put uh, uh, put together uh, uh, the, these various series because they, they pop up in, in odd places still today. Um, 
Another artist uh, who explored the Tokugawa, the, 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 the Tokaido, although not as frequently as, as, as Hiroshiga, uh, was Utagawa Kunisada. Uh, and this is uh, a, a, one of the, the images, the same station, as a matter of fact, Fujikawa, from his 53 stations of the, uh, of the Tokaido, done uh, just about five years later, around 1838. Now, uh, Kunisada was, I'm sorry, a, a contemporary of Hiroshiga. Uh, and uh, hugely pro prolific, um, uh, approximately 25,000 woodblock designs. And that's a lot. As a matter of fact, that's five times what uh, uh, Hiroshiga produced during his lifetime. But he was not a major designer of landscapes. Uh, he did very few landscape series compared to the, the volume of, of Hiroshiga. Um, here in his 53 stations, again on the right, Kunisada is actually copying Hiroshiga. So take a look at the landscape in both of them. They are identical. And so the, the way that Kunisada uh, differentiated his views from Hiroshiga is that he plopped a Bijinga in the middle of each one of them, a beautiful woman. And uh, so uh, two things about this. Um, it's a very typical way to vary presentations of the Tokaido, because if you continue to, to depict the same scene all the time, then you're, you're, you're in, in risk of boring people. So you find new ways to represent the same series. Secondly, um, he's, he, it seems as though he's, he's, he's copying uh, 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 Hiroshiga as though he, doesn't, he can't invent it himself. Uh, but this is not any, any attempt to, to scurry uh, by, by, by any hard work. Um, he's not forging uh, uh, Hiroshiga. It's really an honorific. It's, it's really a, a gesture of respect to use the great master Hiroshiga and his image and then add to it. It's not an uncommon uh, uh, approach in ukiyo uh, at, at all, uh, during, especially during the 19th century. Just two more pairs, uh, two more uh, presentations of the Tokaido. Uh, this is uh, two images from the 53 pairs of the Tokaido from 19, 1845. Um, it's another variation of the Tokaido three theme. In this interest, in instance, each station is paired with uh, a local legend, uh, the writings about which would be well known to Japanese consumers. Uh, for example, there's the history of, uh, uh, so it's, it's actually uh, Sakura Ga Lake and the legend of the sailor Tokuzo. Both of these, these stories were, were pretty well known in Japan at the time of the production and even well before. Um, this is a collaboration and a three-way collaboration. Uh, Kunisada, Kuniyoshi, and Hiroshiga all created images for the series. Um, though they all worked independently on this, um, even had different publishers, which is to say they did their own designs, their publishers produced them, and then only then it came together as a series. It's not uncommon again for artists to even collaborate on the same image. Uh, Kunisada and Hiroshiga would would and on several occasions uh, combine their efforts in single sheets and series uh, over the course of their careers. Now with this last uh, 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 pair, we're starting to approach the decline of UQA, at least especially from a purist perspective. Indeed, some, would say, some, some, some uh, scholars say that UQA peaked in the 18th century with Utamaro essentially being celebrated as the last great, great, uh, great master of the tradition. I differ from that. I think a lot of the, the 19th century landscapes by Hokusai and Hiroshiga especially are, 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 are masters, master presentations of the landscape. Uh, uh, but for the most part, when you get to the second half of the 19th century, you're talking about a gradual denouement of, of the ukiyo-e aesthetic. Uh, these last two prints were created shortly before an event in Japan that had truly historic implications. This is a, 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 a Japanese woodblock print by an unknown artist of Commodore Matthew Perry, an American admiral uh, who in July of 1853 uh, sailed his sh fleet of, of gunships. The Japanese called them the black boats. Um, he sailed the, the fleet into the harbor at Edo in 1853. Um, now remember, we're, we're, we're talking about a, a, a long period of isolation of Japan in which uh, neither, neither America or most other Western nations had any access to Japan unless they're willing to go through the Dutch or the Chinese in order to, uh, to, to barter for, for the goods. Um, there was a huge need to be able to access Japan's goods, especially coal and silk. 
uh, in, in, in the 19th century. Uh, world travel uh, by boat uh, necessitated a, a kind of port that Japan offered. And so uh, 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 Perry was charged by, it was President Fillmore uh, to go to Japan and essentially open it up. Uh, so Perry in 1853 forced his way into the harbor um, and had his demands passed along to the shogun. And there were two major uh, uh, demands. First, uh, he, uh, they were looking to rescue uh, U.S. castaway, uh, United States, uh, American castaway sailors. Uh, uh, over the course of many years, uh, sailors near Japan who were shipwrecked uh, were marooned in Japan. They weren't allowed to leave. So they were essentially kept prisoner in Japan uh, until Perry came. And secondly, of course, it was uh, a message on the part of Perry uh, to say it's time to open up for trade. A year later, Perry came back with even more ships uh, and, and declared that he wouldn't leave the harbor in, in Edo uh, until a treaty allowing access to Japan was agreed upon. And so in March of, 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 March of 1854, March 31st, the Treaty of Kanagawa was signed under threat of force, of course, uh, at, which effectively ended over 200 years of Jap Japan's isolation. Now with the growing presence of foreign powers in Japan, uh, the Tokugawa shogunate declined in authority. Uh, the 15th and last shogun, uh, Yoshinobu Tokugawa, uh, was forced out of office by the emperor at the time who was supported by several daimyos, lords, uh, because they just didn't like the idea of the shogunate, uh, the, the Tokugawa sh shogunate um, having such authority over such a long time. So uh, the, uh, Yoshinobu resigned in 1867, and uh, a year later, the emperor, Meiji, became the new authority. This was the end of the Edo period, again, uh, between which reigned from 1603 to 1867. The Edo period is the uh, Tokugawa period because Tokugawa established his administration in the city of Edo. And uh, it created a new period of Japanese history called the Meiji Restoration, in which the emperor uh, gained back the authority uh, over Japan. And Meiji, the emperor, ruled from 1868 until 1912. So it's a significant period of time. Now, of course, woodblock prints continue to be made, but more frequently, uh, because of the growing Western presence, uh, they were made with themes and subjects that reached beyond the traditional uh, ukiyo-e aesthetic. Um, here is a print, uh, it's an ukiyo-e print, actually, by Utagawa Yoshifuji, uh, Bout of Honor in Yokohama. Uh, this is uh, Western uh, figures, military figures, especially uh, one, one figure uh, fighting with a sumo wrestler. Uh, it, um, it's, it's called Honor of Yokohama because Yokohama was one of the cities early on after the 1854 treaty that was open to Westerners. It actually became open in 1859. And so these prints were called Yokohama A, which is to say uh, 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 Yokohama pictures. And it meant specifically the depiction of non- Japanese figures and subjects. It, and this marked a rapid decline in traditional ukiyo-e, uh, in which um, the, the, the imagery uh, no longer reflected that floating world, uh, no longer reflected that, that feeling of, of uh, uh, enjoying and absorbing life as though you're, you're kind of just floating down a stream and letting everything hit you. Uh, it became much more political, became much more uh, documentary, and so ukiyo-e that was created during the, the uh, Edo regime uh, started to fade away. And uh, there's much more to talk about in terms of woodblock prints in the later 19th century, but this might be a good place to end the talk. So how are we doing? So it's 3.13. Yes, thank you so much. Um, so now I'm going to open up the floor to any Q and A's that anybody might have. So. If you could use the Q and A feature or have a chat. Uh, let's see. Victoria says, "Thank you for this presentation, Patrick. Can you speak more to the impact these ukiyo-e prints and woodblock techniques had on art across the world?" Yes, of course. That's <laughs> that's another talk altogether, isn't it? Because with the opening of Japan, of course. Um, these images began to arrive all over the world, uh, particularly in Europe. And once they were, um, this aesthetic, this, this non-Western approach to imagery excited the heck out of artists in Europe, particularly as we know in, in, in France, in, in Paris, uh, in the 1860s and 1870s, uh, so many artists became enthralled with, with not only 
the, the, the flatness of the imagery, but also the various colorations that the Japanese were able to, to uh, depict, uh, which, which uh, the European artists, uh, the, the realists and the impressionists in particular, began to adopt in their own work. And so it highly influenced not only the coloration, but also the design of painting in, in, in France and in Paris uh, for really a good deal of the second half of the 19th century. It wasn't only of the Impressionists, but also the post-Impressionists, the symbolists such as Vincent van Gogh and, and, and Gauguin. Uh, each of them uh, collected uh, Japanese woodblock prints and utilized the, the, their imagery both directly and indirectly in the, the compositions that they created in the uh, 1880s and 1890s. Hugely influential uh, for Western art in the 19th century. Absolutely. Now our next question is from Ava Jane. Did these prints have an effect on American artists? I'm thinking yes. of Whistler, but is there anyone else? Whistler, um, uh, you know, it was right on the tip of my tongue, and then, uh, but the answer is yes. Um, there are there are a number of artists who are looking at this. Uh, some of them are absorbing it from their visits to to France and to Paris uh, during the later years of the 19th century, uh, but. Adam and, and Aaron are going to chastise me for forgetting the, the guy's name, but there, 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 particularly there are some artists that, that were very enamored of the Japanese woodblock uh, technique, the, the, the approach, and actually made woodblock prints themselves. Uh, so yes, the answer is uh, there was a, a, a strong current in America as well that were enamored of the Japanese tradition, particularly Yukioi tradition. Though I should say that, um, uh, it, it has more to do with uh, the, a formal presentation of the, the ukiyo-e prints rather than the aesthetic behind it. You know, the, the, it's very difficult to duplicate the sense of ennui, if you will, uh, of, of the, the, the Japanese tradition, this idea of taking in everything as it comes to you and, and allowing yourself, surrendering yourself, of course, uh, to these pleasures. Uh, it's just, a, you know, it's an aesthetic that was historical and in, in a society that was very different than European. And so uh, formally, I think they were very influential. I'm not quite sure about the, 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 um, the impetus of the aesthetic itself beyond the formal uh, creations. All right. Next, uh, Linda has requested if you could talk a little bit about the donor, Dr. William Harkins. Oh, yes. Um, William Harkins, a Penn State grad, class of 39, if I'm not mistaken. Um, expert in Eastern European literature, specifically Czech literature, Columbia University for an awful long time. But as a side, he collected Japanese woodblock prints, and he collected tons of them. Uh, he was, uh, during the mid part of the 20th century, uh, very well known, especially in New York City, for his expertise. Uh, he uh, was head of the, the Ukiyo-e Society in New York, I think at least once, if not twice. Um, and uh, because uh, he was a Penn State grad, uh, he, over the years, really starting in the 80s, but throughout the 90s as well, uh, gifted some 500 prints to us. We, I should say, we're not the only institution that he, that, that he, he gave, to, to whom he gave prints. Uh, I, I've encountered his name in Boston, uh, I think at Cornell uh, and some other places. And so uh, he spread the wealth uh, across many institutions, but I have to say that uh, we, we got some very, very good images from, from uh, uh, Dr. Harkins over the, over the years. Yes, absolutely. Can't do this without him. Um, I see that there's a few hands being raised. If you could type your questions in either the Q&A function or the chat, that would be really helpful. But I have a question. I was wondering if the theater was accessible to all people or if they had a limited audience that mm. could attend it. Yeah, and that's a, a level of Japanese society uh, about which I am not terribly cognizant. Um, my, my inclination is to suggest that um, uh, if you had the money, you could go to the performance. 
but also we know that the Japanese society was highly stratified. You know, there were there were norms that uh, excluded individuals. Uh, we know that women were not allowed on the stage after. Actually, they were in a very early part of, of uh, ukiyo-e, but very quickly they were they were they were not allowed on stage. So uh, men played both women, female and male male leads, and it's actually up until literally the last couple of years, uh, that tradition has continued. Uh, only since 2000 have women started to appear on the stage, in, in classic, classical stage. Uh, but in terms of um, uh, different segments of society and the access that they had to them, to, to, to the theater, I, I honestly don't know. Okay, thank you. Um, Karen asks, what is written on the prints, uh, such as the one on the left here? Um, I'm sorry, what, if, what is she asking? What is the text that's written on the prints? You know, I, I, I don't know. Um, we, we had a student here, and he's still, still in the department, uh, Keiji, uh, who is from Japan, and he spent uh, two years ago uh, transcribing a lot of these texts. And I bet the transcription is still, you know, it, he, it's in that, that that text that he gave us. Um, I, I just, I added this uh, this morning, actually, actually this afternoon as a closing thing. So I, I didn't bother to check those out. So it, uh, if KG is here, um, um, he, he, um, he, he, he can tell us, but um, uh, I, I don't know. Kenta is, this is Ken, sorry, Kenta, I'm sorry. Kenta, Kenta is actually in our um, audience. I don't know oh, if you're able to um, join. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I, I'm confusing Kenta with Keiji Shinohara, who is uh, an American who, who does uh, uh, wood, woodblock prints in the Japanese ukiyo style. So uh, uh, Kenta, my apologies for uh, misnaming you. Um, hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, um, so... Um, on the, um, the one on the left, um, if I remember correctly, it's talking about, um, who the audiences are, where, where they come from. Um, it's saying something about, um, some of the audiences being Mexican, American, um, and then it, uh, it's also talking about who the sumo wrestler is and the whole story that, um, he was able to defeat the, foreigner and um, that kind of shows how strong the Japanese are against the, um, the foreigners, the Europeans who are trying to um, invade or um, you know, take over Japan and um, because of a whole history that you talked about, you know, enforcing Japan to reopen the country and all of that. Yeah, and, and thank you, Kenta. Um, uh, he, he was a godsend uh, to us because he went through every, each box of prints and, and transcribed, and I, and I have to say, uh, I think very accurately, uh, the, the, not only the text, but gave us a sense as he just did now uh, to what the, the, the overall impact of the scenery is. And of course, there are added meanings to all of these prints. There are levels of understanding. You know, it's one thing for a Westerner to encounter a Japanese and then they have, a, have this kind of fight, but of course there are other narratives that occur and you know, Japan was, was forced uh, into this situation. You know, they did not um, uh, accept the Westerners willingly. Um, they saw uh, the, the guns on Perry's ships and, and you know, the metal, the, the, the iron cladding and realized that you know, they, they, they had no choice. And so they were forced into this arrangement and it was not a happy one for the Japanese as you can imagine. And so any instance that you can demonstrate the superiority of Japan over the West, um, then, then you're going to get this, these kinds of images. Uh, the problem that we have though with more and more Western imagery coming into these prints, and then uh, the adaption or the adoption of, of Western techniques in Japanese woodblock prints, which changes the, the character entirely. Uh, there are beautiful images, but nonetheless, they are not ukiyo-e, if, if you understand what I'm saying. Um, the, this, this went hand in hand in many instances with a decline in the quality of, of the, the imagery. Um, you were talking about a, a, a very massive um, industrialization that occurred uh, after the Western, Western powers were admitted to Japan. And so with that, you naturally are going to lose a lot of, 
uh, the, the, the technological capability of the older production. Uh, fewer master carvers, fewer master printers. And so the quality of the imagery I have absorbed, observed in the second half of the 19th century suffered because of that. Um, not to say that this isn't a very exciting image. I, you know, I, uh, Yoshi Fuji is, a, is, a, is a, certainly a, a very fine uh, printmaker, but over the course of the, the, the decades from, from 18, 1850 on, um, the traditional ukiyo uh, uh, style, I think, suffered uh, from the, the, the ramp up toward industrialization. Kenta, thanks so much for your work. All right, so um, if there are any last questions, it would be a great time to submit some. You know, Kenta might be able to tell you that last question that we had about um, access to the theater. Kenta might know. Um, so as far as I know, um, Kabuki theaters are actually entertainment for commoners. So, um, and so it was more accessible to common people. Um, Nowadays, it's like a higher up society stuff, but um, back then it was more for the common people. That's why the ukiyo-e prints of actors were a large sale because they were able, actually able to see those um, prints and um, um, th those actors in action and then buy the prints. Um, and I, ima um, I imagine the ukiyo-e prints were, weren't too expensive for um, common people to buy as well. And um, a lot of those images actually, um, those, um, the names actually um, still retain in Japanese society. For, so for instance, um, um, in a Japanese kabuki theater, you have images of the actors um, in, the ent uh, in, the, in the entrance of the theater and the second guy um, on that, um, the second portrait on the entrance of the theater would usually be the main character. So we, we still say that, oh, yeah, he's a second guy, which means that he's a look, good looking main character type of a guy. Or um, the third person um, portrait on the entrance of the theater would be a, a more comedic person. So we would say somebody who's really funny or comedic would be, oh, he's a third portrait type of a guy. So, you know, those, um, words still re retain in Japanese society. That's really interesting. Thank you so much. Um, also, I would like to wrap this up and th first of all, thank Dr. McGrady and the Palmer for allowing us to have this opportunity to have this wonderful talk. And then thank you all for attending. So have a great rest of your day, everyone. <laughs>